<laughs> so, Leandro, first of all, I am just so excited that they picked the two of us to talk to each other because you know that journey. But anyway, um, I don't know. Do you have brothers and sisters or are you an only child? Because I don't know. I have brothers and sisters. And where do you fit in? I'm uh, somewhere in the third from the baby. Third from the baby. So yeah. how many of it? How many were there of you? Well, my mom was married three times, so it's about eight of us. Okay, so but but by 1961, how many? Was it just you and older siblings? Six. It was six, and you were Including at that time, me. like the fourth Number or the six. fifth. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't know that. So you so um, when. The desegregation process started in Memphis, Tennessee. I never knew. Tell me that story because did you get the call the night before or something like that? Actually, um, I was an alternate. Right. So I was um, scheduled to go to Lincoln Elementary or Orleans. So somebody um, didn't make it. So a... My my father was uh, big in the NAACP, and he, he got a call that they needed another child. So it was like, hey, I got one. So I, that's when I got the call to to be a part of the Memphis 13. Oh, I didn't know that. So your father was working with the NAACP mm -hmm. in Memphis, yeah, Tennessee big at the time. NAACP. Yes. Yeah. No, you know I did not know that. Yeah. Okay, and so you just happened to be the right at age at the right time. So you never went to Lincoln or the other schools. So when you went to Roselle, that was the first. That was my first, very first school. And um, trying to be a big boy, it was a big thing for me. It was a big deal. Um, because you see your mother, father going to work or whatever, and you sit back and just want to emulate them. And this is my first. First day, I, I mean, I'm feeling like a big boy. Okay, I'm going to school. I'm going to do something big. So they just, so did you, did you all like get the call the night before or a couple of nights before? To be honest, I'm not sure okay. because I'm five. I, right. You know. Right. So um, actually a George Smith, I think he was, he was another big uh, NAACP person in the neighborhood. I mean, my stepfather were real good friends, so. He got the call from Maxine Smith or somebody like that, and that's when all that happened. So I got drafted to go. Okay. All right. And what about you? Did you did your father, Reverend Cows, was this uh, something y'all had planned or y'all had talked about it, discussed it, or how did that go? Well, first, my parents – lived in Chicago. So we were not from Memphis. We were from Chicago. My parents, both my my parents met in, in, in and, I, and I never can tell the story without talking about their story because they were so young. Mm -hmm. They were like 24, 25 years old at the time. They moved to Memphis because they wanted to be a part of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. I think at that time, Martin King had already started the bus boycott in, 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 in Alabama. And so, you know, my father was uh, a coming up minister, and he happened to come to Memphis, I say to audition, whatever they call it, for a church in Memphis that had split. Mm -hmm. And so they were starting over, and he got the position, and the, the, with three small children under the age of four, we moved to Memphis. And uh, since they wanted to be a part of it, and you know, that's not always the easiest thing because you need to be homegrown to do certain things, and they just jumped, they jumped in the deep end immediately. So dad was actually something like the director of uh, education for the NAACP. Uh, Russell Sugarman and A.W. Willis uh, had been working on this, you know, uh, since they first you know, got the information back in the 50s, 56, 57, or whenever it passed, Brown versus Board of Education. So uh, they, Daddy was on there, and I tell everybody, I just happened to be the right age at the right time because it, my brother is 15 months older. My sister was 15 months younger at the time. My youngest brother hadn't been born yet. And I just happened to be the right age at the right time. And um, there was just, you can't go out in the field 
and ask other parents to do what you're not willing to do. So A.W. Willis's son, who was who was Michael, who's Fomby now, uh, he he was the, of the right age because I think he's two days younger, and we were both five, going on six, and so we ended up being at the same school together. And it's really interesting because it wasn't until Daniel did the um, it wasn't until Daniel did the documentary that I ever knew that I never went to Cummings because I lived in walking distance of Cummings mm. Elementary School, and that's where my brother went. And I would go with my grandmother sometime to pick my brother up from school. And um, I didn't know until, because I, I think, I think in, the, in the documentary, I don't know if that part made it, but I can remember saying I went to Cummings first. And then I remember hearing my father said, no, that was the first school she ever went to, and that's when I knew that... Uh, that Bruce was the first elementary school I ever went to. And we didn't go on the first day. We went in October. And I think the reason that we did was because they couldn't find enough families because they really had to vet families. That's why it's so interesting. Right. And I'm asking, how was it that you came? Because I never knew that until I think we were at WDIA after the documentary mm -hmm. had come out. Yeah. Yeah. Was Money Mill the first uh, church your father was? That was his first and only church okay. that he ever pastored, and that's what brought us to Memphis, Tennessee, and how he really became involved in the civil rights movement. And, um, you know, it really was a family on the first line because we were just, he was at the front. Of, and it wasn't just him. It was like the whole family. If there was whatever, we were going to be there. We were going to be one of those that was on the front line. And so... Uh, uh, what I try to get a lot of people to understand is that the desegregation process, what, what it being in the education system was what really uh, opened it up to the rest of the nation on a level that no other system had done up until that time. That's why the, that ruling was just, I don't know what other ruling has come after that that has been that magnanimous and that great as what the, as Brown versus Board of Education? Well, you know, I think we were the second, because we hadn't really moved where we were, mm -hmm. um, just recently had moved there. We in the neighborhood? You're talking about in the neighborhood? Right, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think we were like the second black family to move on that street. Get out. And on top of that, after after that, I started going to Roselle. Um, and in the beginning, Roselle was like three or four miles from where I live. Mm -hmm. So some kind of way they had worked out where they would actually send a taxi cab, Joyce, Joyce Bell and I. Yes. They sent a taxi cab to pick us up every day. And take you to school. Take us to school every day. And... That soon, that didn't last very long. So that was another problem on top of all the other things that were going on that kind of um, made that come to an end after maybe a year or so. Now, you had older brothers and sisters at the time. What school right. were they going? Were they in elementary well, school, and what school were they going to? Well, they, they went to the uh, regular neighborhood schools. They went to the regular. So what was the difference in did you feel a difference in the experience that you were having as opposed to the experience that they were having when they came when y'all came home from school? Of course. Um, they went to neighborhood schools. I went to a school where there was only four black children in the whole school, and that was the Razia Four. Um, we integrated the school, and we were. Uh, segregated with each other because they never they didn't put us in the same classroom or anything. So did y'all get to see each other when you went out on the playground? Y'all didn't know, even back see each then, other. They just kind of marched kids, you know, in and out and whatnot. No, never really got a chance to see each other. So that's the big difference, you know. They were like used to, you know, they, it was just an everyday thing for them, just normal living. But for me, it was kind of uh, um, hell when you went. And that was all day long. That was every day. For a five-year-old, I think that's kind of rough because at five, you know, you're still a sponge. I mean, you're, you're, you're soaking oh in God, yeah. everything that, that, that's around you. 
And that kind of left a bitter taste in my mouth as a child. So do you remember your first day at Roselle or that first week? I do, kind of, kind of, sort of. Um, um, you know, when I think in, in up until the last, until about 2010, mm-hmm. when Daniel Keel brought this, brought this out, brought this to the light out of the darkness, it's something that I think your, your mind um, erases a lot mm. of stuff, trauma stuff like that, and you just go through life with it and not even think about it. Mm-hmm. And then when somebody come along and bring it back, open it back up, then and and and, and with interviewing with you and the rest of the thirteen, it kind of you know wakes up a lot of stuff that was there that you really didn't know or forgot. That was there. Mm -hmm. So I think as we go on, like I learn something new every time we even get together. Right. Because it's something in in the in the black neighborhood, you hear gunshots all the time. Well, that's normal. But you know, people get mistreated. That's kind of normal. It's kind of a norm. Mm -hmm. But at that time, you know, as being a child, that's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of hard on a five year old just learning the world or trying to learn the world. And as life go on, it pretty much is the same way, you know? Mm-hmm. So so was there a particular incident or many incidents that happened at school that really, because I never knew, seriously, until, I, until we did the mural reveal this past October, mm-hmm. and I asked G.A., I was like, G.A., when I go back and I look at the documentary, the kids that went to Rozell they had a much harder time than the kids who went to any of the other schools. And I asked him why. He said, Dewana, that was the blue-collar neighborhood. So he didn't say this, but I'm saying this. That's equivalent to Trumpsters, you know, in 2023. And so they were, you know, and, and the neighborhood that I went to school in, the neighborhood that Springdale was in, um, was... Uh, uh, white collar workers. So there was definitely, you know, a lot of racism in the schools that basically came from the older teachers. I because thank God my first grade teacher was young, Miss Patrick. She had to be in her twenties, newly married, I think. And so that made it easier. But Rozell was in the heart of so those families in, at, in the Rozelle neighborhood were equivalent to those folk that were in, that the little not Little Rock Nine came up against. Yes. That was that energy. Yes, that was Because if they had been, if they had been allowed to come out, they would have definitely been throwing bottles or whatever and, you know, using. Well, you know, that's, that's actually where the term white flight came from because... Once we started there, and I had one one white friend that I can remember. His name you was did? John Henry. Okay. But that was short-lived because his parents took him out. You know, that's like I said, that's where white flight came from. Because it's like, no, you don't do that. You don't you don't associate with them. You know, simple as that. And I do remember one thing that actually comes to mind, I can't prove it. But um, one day, Buford Ellington, which was a governor of Tennessee at the time, and he actually kind of had a hand in um, placing, I think he placed the first black man into some position. He actually flew to Roselle in a helicopter. I remember that. And they let me on on the helicopter. Um, and I mean, it's vague, and I can't, you know, I can't find anybody to uh, confirm that. But mm-hmm. I doubt if my mind would just create something like that um, and just make it up. So I do remember that. Mm-hmm. But other than that, him and John Henry probably was the best two things that ever happened during my uh, era at Roselle. So what other things were happening like that? just made you break down? Because I think you eventually told your parents, I just can't do it anymore. Right, right. Well, those steps we were talking about that you enter, when you enter into the front door of Roselle, you'll see tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I remember going up those stairs and 
kids on both sides. You going up the center, right? And you got kids on both sides, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, using racial slurs and all types of things like that. That was like on a daily basis. And most teachers um, would just kind of turn a blind ear. Yeah. You know, so those are just some some things that I can remember. And, you know, like I said, that's 60-plus years ago. So I don't remember it all, but I know it wasn't a pretty sight until I eventually told my mom. And on top of that, they stopped the cab, you know, stuff. So she said, it's about time to take my child out of there. It's getting a little mm-hmm. too So tough. did you repeatedly say, I don't want to go to the school anymore? Well, I don't you, want to go to the school anymore? Well, you know, like you come home, you, you know, first thing your parents going to want to know is how did your day go? Absolutely. Right? And you so would say, my report wasn't very good every day. Right. So, you know, once we got it started, they felt like, okay, well, that's enough. That's enough. We got the ball rolling, right? So let's get the kid out, and they'll have to pick up the slack from there. And once I came back, I do remember being at Orleans the same day President uh, uh, Kennedy died. Mm-hmm. So I guess that was 63. Yeah, 63. So I stayed there a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's how the story went at Rosia. But I don't know. Everybody seemed like everybody went there. Clarence Williams. I know. Uh, Joyce. Um, I, I, EC, I never really got a chance to talk to her. Felt the same way. Yeah, you know, that but, broke my heart yeah. when, 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 when Clarence says, oh, that experience taught me, t- I know what my place is. Didn't he say something yeah, to that? I know what is. my place mm-hmm. in life is, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, and, and, um, and, when he, and when he talks about, you know, <laughs> being in the lion's den and you the pork chop <laughs> and, you know, and, and being on the front line, and when you're five years old, when you get hit, how much that hurts. He was just so prolific to me in terms of how he expressed how he expressed that. But here again, he went to Rozell. So you all got it out the gate hard where we got it, you know. And, and I always felt like what I always tell people is if they had left the first graders alone we would have been fine. It right. was the older kids. Right. Be- and lo and behold, if you had an older brother or an older sister that saw their little first grade sister or cousin or whoever playing with, playing with you, because they would go and tell on, they'd be like, you be around that little nigga, I'm going to be, I'm going to tell mama, and you know what's going to happen to mm-hmm. you when you get mm-hmm. home. Exactly. So, yeah. So uh, uh, then they would, the next day, you wouldn't have a friend. Or the next week, you wouldn't have a friend. And, and so and I think that was what was really hard. But a lot of times when people ask me, you know, well, what was the first day like? I was like, you know, it wasn't about racism the first day. I mean, I realized, and only because I thought I had gone to Cummings, you know, but just going to pick up my brother and drop him off or whatever. You know, I knew the kids were not black. I knew that at five years old. But I didn't. Ha- I wasn't afraid, and I didn't think any harm was going to come to me. And I always tell people when they ask me about that first day, I was like, "Well, I was more pissed at my parents for leaving me someplace by myself. Like, where are you going? Where's Dashina? Where's Dwayne? What do you mean I'm staying here by myself? I was more devastated f- from that." being the first day of school and this is going to be the first time that I'm away from my parents and not with somebody that I know. Right. You know, so that was really hard for me. That was what was the hardest in those first few days. Um, And then, you know, if I'm in the bathroom, you know how they used to line the whole class up and the boys would go to the bathroom and the girls would go and then they let a certain amount go in and then when they came out, then the other set would go in. Well, lo and behold, if any of the older kids came in, I I just remember, I hated going to the bathroom. I hated going to the bathroom because inevitably one of the older kids would come in and I would try to sit on the toilet and 
And it was a very difficult thing to do because I'm five years old, five, six years old. I'm trying to sit on the toilet and I'm trying to hold the door open. I mean, close, because the older girls would come and open it and ask me to show them my tail. And, you know, in those days, you know, black people were supposed to have tails, tails, Mm -hmm. you know, literally on our bottoms. We were supposed to have tails. And, you know, their bullying wasn't the word at that time, you know. But here again, it wasn't coming from other first graders or even second graders. It was always coming from the kids that were older, your fifth graders. You know, it, you know. I always forget what grade it did. It was it one through six or whatever. You know, yeah, the, it was always six. the older kids, though. You know, which is one of the reasons why, in Memphis, as I understand it, the NAACP wanted to start with the babies. You know. I love it when Fami says, we were babies, you know, and we were. And, right. uh, but, but I think that's why it was nonviolent. I, I think that's why people don't know our story uh, because they don't want folk to know that the desegregation slash integration process really did work until they started undermining it. So do you think it would have not been violent if we hadn't had hundreds of police? And I think as I, as, as you know, I, it was Daniel's film that really brought us back to it. I couldn't even articulate what I can talk about now uh, when Daniel first, and even in the film, I cringe when I look at the film because I'm like, eh, eh, I'm not using my words. I'm using all of this, but that's how it was coming up for me, you, you know? Oh, yeah. And um, and I don't know how big I was on really sharing things because to survive, because of the 13, I was the only one that went from 1 through 12. So my experience was really crazy, you know, um, and... And, and, and so thank God that uh, Daniel wanted to do this film and want to know, well, what happened to those kids that did that? Uh, but as I've done some research, I think I remember seeing where the Chamber of Commerce was like, we are trying to bring new business into Memphis, so we do not want anything to go wrong. So the fact that we were babies and the fact that the business community had also stepped in and basically said to people, look, we ain't having all that that happened over in Arkansas. That's not what we're going to do here. But by the same, and, 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 and few people know that at the end of that first day of October 3rd, 1961, uh, President Kennedy and his brother called the mayor, Loeb, you know, who was a staunch racist, who, who kept a shotgun under his desk, you know, yes. to congratulate him on the success of the nonviolence. And I really believe with all my heart, because it was nonviolence and because we're always just looking for what sensationalism, that that is the reason that nobody really knows our story and, and how, uh, you know, and how well everything went that that first day. Plus, I'm sure with the chief of police telling his, his man the night before <laughs> that if if y'all can't protect these young, young negros, negros, turn in your badge tonight. Ain't that something? I'm pretty sure that had a little something else to do with it. But because <laughs> he said, I'm a segregationist, I always will be, but I'm a law man. So I got to do my job. Mm-hmm. Wasn't about us, no, about the job. It was about right? the job, right? Right. So, you know, the the, the honey, the, it was about job and money. Let's get exactly, that straight. Exactly, you got the Chamber of exactly, Commerce exactly. saying, "Look, we're trying to bring business to Memphis, so we're going to do this right." So, you know, I, I, I'm just glad that whatever it took, that that we did it, it and it went off without a hitch, uh, and. But one of the things that really hurt, I think, even, even more so, there was no relief for me. I don't know about for you, but there was no relief for me because I would go to school during the day and be bullied and shunned by the white kids. Then I would go to my neighborhood and be shunned 
because I thought supposedly I'm better than everybody else because you go to that white school. So you're just getting it from both sides. So what happens is, is you just shut down. Thank God for Dwayne and Drashina that you have your brother and your sister because that becomes your world until you get older and the other kids start going, going to... Right you know, maybe middle school, you know, or what have you. But when I think about growing up, why was I always so close? Who was I the closest to? And it was like the Willis's, the Smiths, and the, the and everybody I was the closest to, they were either children of ministers, like my dad, or they were NAACP families, you know, that were, were, were the ones that were... Um, you know, always the ones that were showing up, you know. So you actually went to Bruce from 1 through 12? I went to Bruce, then I went across the street to Bellevue, and then I went up the street to Central and okay. graduated from, from Central, Central in the 12th grade. And it, it was really hard because I graduated with white kids that I loved, you know, and you couldn't, um, you, you weren't free to even, you know, yeah, I, I had white boy. I didn't have white boyfriends when I was in school, but that didn't mean I didn't like them. You like who you are around. You like what your environment is. Love is not a color. Well, that's true, you know. But it, but the world doesn't right. live in the world like, exactly. and we don't live in the world like that, you know. Exactly. And and uh, I, I think that's why I'm so excited about the opportunity that we have with the, uh, the with the foundation that we will be able for everybody to be able to tell their side of the story because it doesn't make a difference what side of the coin that you are on, really. Both sides of those coins were filled with pain, you know, pain, pain that we even have to, to do something called desegregate, pain because why aren't we living in the world like human beings as opposed to all of these labels that we've given ourselves? You know, we're, we're just stuck on labels and figuring out yet another way to separate. How can we separate ourselves even more? And so, you know, having the opportunity to curate experiences where people can come and learn to listen, first of all, because that's what we don't, we're not good listeners. We don't listen well, which is why this is such a great project, because people can go and listen and to Real people's stories. And then through those stories, we will find out we are really not that different. Um, and whether I'm on this side of the coin and I'm in pain because you're not, because at the end of the day, everything is money. You're not putting enough money into these schools, these black schools, as opposed to the white schools where you're putting all the money. Uh, and uh, uh, Or if I'm on that side of the coin and I'm like, I don't want my kids, I'm afraid, I don't want my kids going to, get to school with those kids for things that aren't even really real, but for false belief systems. So until we are able to be in a situation where we cure, help to curate the experience that people can have in terms of learning how to listen to each other, listen to your story, listen to my story, you know, across the, you know, and, and, and make sure that the audience is balanced who's having that experience. So we have to create these experiences, which is one of the things that I think could have been done during desegregation if they had really wanted it to work. Because you, you can't, you, you know, when we had the mural reveal at Bruce right before COVID hit, I, 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 Jeremy, Jeremy, one of the journalists, you know, I'm not going to say his last name, and he was kind of upset with me because he wanted me to be very militant. And he was like, oh, what do you think? How do you feel that um, the schools are as segregated? This was in 2020. The schools are as, seg are as segregated in 2020 as they were in 1961. And I looked at him. I was like, in 1961, it was about the law. So I don't care what we needed to do. The law needed to change just so we could have the option. That was first. That was key. The law to change. I was like, now, in 2020, we have to look at it and say, okay, why are we still here where we were, you know, what was that, 50-some-odd years ago, you know? 
uh, 58 years or so ago. Why are we still there? Obviously, it's not about law. So what is it? You can't, you didn't go with us to the Capitol. At the Capitol, when I was, when I spoke on behalf of the Memphis 13, I was like, in it's not enough to change laws. What are the hearts? What is the belief that accompanies changing a law? Because if we're not shifting what, how people feel in their hearts, if we're not allowing oxytocin to help you know, open that heart space up so the heart can start helping to shift the belief system because so much of what we do, not just in the education system, so much of the way we live on the planet is just so backwards and it doesn't have to do, it has to do with things. They've got us, you know, addicted to things. When you ask a person what makes you happy, they'll tell you some food that they eat or, or some vacation that they want to take. But, but what just makes you happy? Can you just make yourself happy sometimes? Can you, can you laugh at yourself like that? Do you love yourself well enough to do something like that? Well, segregation, integration, um, do you think a teacher can actually teach a student that he or she despises properly? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. You know. So, Back to the fact of changing hearts. You got to change hearts Come to change on. minds. You can't, I Come mean, you can, you can change the racism picture frame, but racism remains the same. Right. See yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. You can put the laws and flip them and all that, but if it's still, the picture's still going to be the same. Right, and that picture is going to be filled with pain. Right. And because it, it's rooted in the pain, or at least this is, you know, this has been my experience, you know. Um, I, I, I went to uh, New York to pursue a career in theater. And literally, I would be at a table like this. You know, the producer, the director, the writer would be on that side of the table. I'm on this side of the table and, um, you know, doing my uh, monologue. And... <laughs> And the white director would look me in my eye and say, yeah, well, that was good, but this time I'd like for you, could you do it over for us, and could you be more black? I didn't want to act anymore, and that's all I had ever wanted to do all my life. The exit stage left, right? No, it was worse than that. The first time it happened, I had to, I was shook. I was shook. And I had to breathe. The second time it happened, you know, because you know what, you know what they meant. They want you to be ghetto. They want you to do all the neck rolling and all exactly. of that, you know, which was not my life, you know. Uh, and and I, so I, I just, you know, I tried to have a little bit more patience the second time, the third time it happened, I literally saw myself in my head jump over the table and I was strangling the person. This is what was going on in my head when they said that because, and I think, I think my eyes start rolling up in my head a little bit and I think I just walked out of, I think I just walked out of the audition and I really believe that was probably the last audition I went to. I said, you know, as long as I can be creative, I'm good because if another ask me that question, I'm gonna hurt somebody and I'll be blacklisted in this community for the rest of my life because I'm gonna hurt somebody for real. And that was all of what had been buried all those years and just bubbling up. That, and I knew that's what it was. And so I didn't trust myself to go to auditions because they're just, they were so horrid, you know, nose jobs, you know, so my nose was too black. You know, you, it, just what they thought they could say. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and, and, and folk knew better than to talk to you like some of the that's coming out of these mouths. So I'm going to do something else. So I got into the music industry and started writing. I went there on a scholarship to dance, you know, so I just focused on the other areas of creativity because I just didn't want to do anything where I had to go and audition again. And even when I got in the music industry, they were like, uh, they were like, the black people would say my songs were too pop. 
and then the white a and r people would be like just because i'm black well we're not looking for any r and b same song same song both sides you know so it's like when do you get a chance to win you know uh when do you get a chance to win you know yeah well my 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 um the segregation experience um put in my mind to always stay two steps ahead um, because I knew what was possibly waiting on me out there. And I've always had a mindset of when I got my first driver license, I got special chauffeur license. Back in the day, that was a thing. Mm. Um, that way, if, if, they couldn't, if they didn't want to accept driver license, okay, well, I got special chauffeur license. How about that? You know, I've always, I've bought real estate. I even bought a piece of Elvis Presley's land back in, what? before he died. Um, just things that you know in life from your past that you want to try to jump that hurdle in the future. So having my own has always been a pet peeve of mine. And I've always looked at that. And desegregation brought that about for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's It's been an interesting ride. Um, and if anybody had asked me what I think uh, I would be working with the Memphis 13 Foundation right now, really getting that story, it wasn't a really a story that I was interested in telling. It was a, a story that... I really went to New York. Part of my wanting to go to New York was to be anonymous. I wanted anonymity. I just, I was just tired. I remember in the 11th grade when I was uh, applying for colleges, I literally stood up in the dining room chair and I told my parents, I will not, I have done my part. That's what I told them in a skirt that was way too short for me to be standing up, you know, but I told them, I said, I've done my part and I will not be going to a white college or university. It is time for me to have a black experience in the education system. So I will be going. And I think I was the only one of my siblings other than my sister. My sister followed me to Spelman and she stayed for two years, but I was the only one to graduate from a historically black university, which was Howard University. I went to Spelman for two years and because I wanted to take an extra year, I went to Howard for three and graduated from Howard. My brother graduated from Lake Forest, which was one of the richest colleges, uh, small private colleges in this country. And my sister graduated from Georgia George Washington, which was another pretty big college. And my youngest brother, he came six years later. And I think he ended up graduating from the University of Memphis. I don't, he started off at Lake Forest, but I think he ended up gr graduating from the University of, uh, of, of uh, Memphis. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I'd done my part. And so I didn't, and my father was the only one that would ever talk about that process, but that was in his story from the witness, you know. So he would talk about that because he would go all over talking about the witness from the balcony of room 306, you know, his experience with Martin King. So um, I, I, I would only hear about it then. And I remember, I would never go hear my father speak. I think I had to be about 35 when I finally went to hear him talk about that because after the assassination, he was just so shook up with the whole thing that he didn't know what to do for the first 10 years. And it was really a bad for 10 years because he would just wake up you know, with having nightmares and screaming and all that kind of stuff. And people don't understand the other side of it. Assassination, Mark. Right, King. right, right. And so finally, when I finally did go and hear, you know, when he had figured out what he needed to do, and, and without me ever asking him, I, al I always would tell people, I said, my father has to talk about it because it's helping him heal. You know, that's why I understand why it's so important for us to heal. And that's really what's the problem the whole world. We just need to heal because we're in just too much pain and we're just in this loop and we're in this loop and we don't know how. Um, but uh, it was so interesting after, I think it was 
I think it was after he's passed that uh, someone who had been working on a documentary actually gave me uh, some of the print out of you know what he had talked about. So of what of the script of it wasn't a script, but you know what uh, he had said, the translation of what he had said, and he said it was it was uh, cathartic for him to talk about that. So he, he felt good because he helped give people closure, but it was just as much for him. And I began to feel that way with our story. And, and before we finish, I just, I just want you to know that I'm so happy to be sitting here doing this with you, Leandro, because you didn't want to be a part of us because you felt like because it was only six months or however long it was that you didn't deserve and I just didn't agree with you and I just I just kept I just kept at you and I know everybody else did too but I just wasn't gonna let that go and so I, I couldn't think of a better person to be it. sitting here doing I that I appreciate with it. it like I said once before it's kind of like preacher being called a preacher some sent and some just went right so I think it's just my um, legacy yes. to take the word on. I mean, I try to, and my thing now is, is kids. I, I just want kids to know. I try to have them to, thing I was taught as a child is one thing about education. If they can take anything else away, they can't take that. Absolutely. Right? I try to instill in kids to, Good, better, best. Make you good, better, and you better, and you best. You know what I mean? Mm. So if if I can get one out of ten, right, to do better or to realize where you come from right, and to protect your future because without the kids, the future is, is very dim, yes. right? Yeah. I don't know what mindset kids are in nowadays, but somebody got to get them out of it. Because, you know, you don't want to let the things that have been built up fall down. That That's kind of... Defeating the purpose. Yeah. Right. Going backwards. Right. Going backwards. I agree. I right. agree. Right. Somebody needs a shoulder to stand on. We had to stand on, you Absolutely. know, somebody's shoulder. And, 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 you know, they need to have a shoulder for somebody to stand on. Just try to keep... Keep the conversation going, if nothing else. Right. I mean, we've come a long ways, but we got a long ways to go. But if you stop, everything stops. It goes back to the way it was. I don't think and you. And they try that. real hard to do that, right? right? right. Make it Reversing great again. everything, you know. And it's not that I want to go back. I want us to create new systems right. and move forward. I right. don't need exactly. to fix what's exactly. broken because it wasn't. It's it 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 wasn't operating to the quality that it could be in the first place. So I'm not interested in reinstituting all of that. I'm really interested in creating systems that are sustainable. And really sustainable, not that fake sustainable. Because there's a there's a gentleman that has a book out called The Culture of Make Believe, and I just love that because I think that we basically live in a culture of what we want it to be or what the what we think it is, but not what it is. And I want us to be able to face that. And I want us to be able to face that with courage. I want us to be able to face that with love and move from that vantage point and wanting to heal. Everything that I do is really focused on how do we heal? Because mm -hmm. when we heal, that is connected to the love energy. And when we are in that energy, then we can keep going from there. Amen on that. Do we have time for a few follow-ups? Oh my gosh. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm curious, I, so many things I wanna ask about, but. Um, were there noticeable kind of divisions within the black community when, like, desegregation became Girl, an they're option? All, they're and, how, and if so, <laughs> what made your families opt in? You want to go first? Go ahead. Um, yeah. But, yes. Always, and there always has been, but I think if history has taught us anything is that it's never been all the people that are responsible or even involved in the biggest changes that we've had are made in the United 
it's not just in the United States, in the world, period. And so my parents wanted, my parents wanted to opt in because they could think of no better way to create a legacy and to help people than to be a part of it. We like, my biggest thing today is people are always, oh, I can't believe this happened. And I'll be like, how could you not believe it? Let's go <laughs> back and look at the root. How can you not believe that that happened? I can't believe when the right, the good thing happens. That's when I can't believe it. What, what about you, Lee? Exactly. That's true. Exactly. Always. It's always been, always been different. Um, like I said before, we were the second black family to move on the street. And this is, a, what, maybe 50, 60 houses on the street. Um, within a year's time, um, <laughs> it was <laughs> at least 40 of them, the white families were gone. So... You know, that's that's on that's at the start. That's five, six years old. So yeah, it's always been and, and my like I said, my stepfather was uh an advocate of NAACP and everybody he knew. He probably knew uh Dewana's father personally. Oh, sure. You probably have seen him, but uh, you know, you, you try to make bad good and, and, and by any means necessary. So that was a part of their thinking when they sent us over to Right. Uh, school wanting to make the world a better place for real what that really means not that fake you know uh, we wanted resources the, the black schools didn't have heat you know heavy with the lead we got the old they got the new books we would get their old books you know um, uh, no, yeah. I ever right. anything like ice cream, which is a big thing in the film. You know, right, right. Uh, Elvis is crazy. I got a new book. I think, well, partially new, kind of, sorta. When I went to high school, and it had been maybe just turned five years from being all white. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so it was never that we want to come in and be disruptive just to be disruptive. No, we are really wanting to just know equal. what it means to be human beings. Yeah, just equal. Human no beings. No more, right. no less, just equal. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want my book to look just like her book, you know. That's I want to have the options. I want right. to have options, you know. Um you know, again, Jeremy got really upset with me because I said, Jeremy, at this point, if we don't change hearts, we're going to keep repeating. If we don't change hearts and shift those belief systems, we're going to keep repeating the same thing over and over again. I said, but let me tell you this. We are undermining our children. Because we're not, I don't care, I don't even care if it's a charter school, private school, I don't care what the school is, they are not getting the best education, especially in this country right now. First of all, with all this testing that's going on. So at the end of the day, are we looking at where the money is going? Because we're an American and we all know it's follow the money. How many times can we hear that story? But it's really true. And when I say we live in the culture of make-believe, people know that and they'll say that, but yet and still, they'll keep doing the same things that allow those practices practices to still be in place. And so, so why are we even acknowledging it if that's what we're going to do? So it takes a few people. It takes a few people who are going to be consistent, you know. Um, I remember, you know, rightfully so, uh, 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 six or seven years ago, um, some folks saying, well, you know, they kind of just forgot about us. You know, the NAACP, they came, they found us, and then they forgot about us. But the truth of the matter is you have a small group of people who have moved on to the next thing, and you don't. We, there are no people who came, came up behind them to make sure that what we put in place was growing from that point, you know. So we've not done the best job, in, and I'm not just talking about in terms of civil rights. I don't think we do it in most systems that we have. We don't do a good job of having the follow through consistently as the ones who started it keep pushing the envelope forward. They can't, they can't be the same people that are going to come back here and maintain it. So who's back here maintaining it? And I think we dropped the ball in many different areas in, uh, you know, in our society like that. Can I have you guys tell each other, I always have to I remind myself to say that, um, what you remember about when your families or parents sat you down and, and told you you would be going to white schools? Well, my parents were <laughs> like, 
okay, you'll be going to Roswell Elementary, and your mission is we're trying to make things better for kids that look like you, black and brown kids. So with it being mama saying that, first of all, that's a thumbs up. And in your mind, even at five, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that's going to make it better for my cohorts, my, my friends and, 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 and other people. And that was good enough for me. So I was off. I was off to it. Yeah, yeah. I would. I, I would. I would have to agree with that. You know, um, it's not that I think I understood racism on a level right. at five years exactly. old. That just wasn't so. But what I did understand was we were constantly doing things that maybe everybody else wasn't doing the way that they were doing it. And it's real interesting because I still am like that in my life. And a lot of times people are like, oh, you just want to be different to be different. And I'm like, we're kind of like, no. My parents kind of taught me. I mean, I would come home and tell my parents things, which I think when it was so interesting, just like you said, your parents checked in with you every day. Right. There was no book on how to desegregate a school. It was so important to come home and talk about that experience that you were having, you know, uh, because I don't know about you, but I just learned how to live in my head. It, it, it's amazing how you could just be in the room and not be there because you, I, it, it would just get to a point where I could just, I can't listen to what it is that they're saying because it doesn't make me feel good. And, and, and to know that, I knew that as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old. And like Fomby says, I was so happy for the, the lunchroom workers and the janitors who were black because you knew they could just look at you in a certain way and whatever pain you were going through, it just lifted that pain a little bit. But, you know, uh, you knew that you were doing something. You not, didn't really understand the, uh, the breadth and right. the depth of it. But, yeah, you knew that whatever it was, that you were doing this was something and that's why I always say family on the front line because yeah we, we, we knew we were doing something mm -hmm. um, and you've mentioned a few times now something that uh, resonated with me and that was kind of this we're now at the point where like the laws are changed and we've got this harder step to change hearts and minds and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious if either when you were students or now whether you've seen examples of that happening at all. It, is there a sign of hope that you've seen? Coming? Absolutely, and unfortunately, I don't believe that those are the, just like our story, those are not the stories that they want to promote. Uh, and, and, you know, it's the proverbial they. We know who the they is. It's the very few people who have all the money in the world while 98% of the people have the rest. How can this many people have over half of all the money in the world or have, you know, uh, uh, power over that money? And, you know, uh, uh, so as long as, as that faction and we just... You, you know, we just allow ourselves to be controlled by them. Um, we're we're going to keep experiencing the same thing over and over. So we're not going to hear from the schools and the students and the situations, which is why I'm also interested in the platform that we have. And as it goes forward to open this conversation up and really listen to everybody's story because they are so different. The stories are so diverse just amongst the, the you know, the 10 of us that are still on the planet, they're very different. They're the same, yet they're very different. There are things about it that are j just very different. So I think that, you know, having the opportunity to bring more people to the table and to listen to their stories that we can, because y'all know it's all about the story, uh, we can begin to uh, shift our hearts, understand what empathy is, and to understand, oh, my God, he's in as much pain as I'm in, which is what I've always said to you. I don't care if you were there. I know you know what it felt like right. as a five, as a six-year-old, and it was not easy. 
it just wasn't easy. But yeah, I think I think there's a lot of hope. I think there are a lot of folk that are are approaching it right. The schools, there are schools in Baltimore, anywhere where they put breath work and meditation and yoga in schools, they know that this works. They're not, not interested in people being empowered, you know, the proverbial they. Right. <laughs> I know them well. <laughs> Well, yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of see a little here and there, but no, oh, I kind of see a little here and there, but five at five year old, you got it. And and just to show you the difference, the, on my job that I'd retired from from thirty some years, my first week there, as a late twenty year old, my manager. Not the lead, not the supervisor, but my manager called me a, a nigger in, 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 in a room full of white people. I didn't hear him. I'm standing in front of a big printer because I was in IT, a big printer. But he came to me later and apologized to me for that. And, of course, you know I was mad, but <laughs> my supervisor said, Lee, you coming back? I said, I, I got to go and chill for a minute. But, see, I'm talking about. It's always going to be some resistance. And that's why I'm so set on keeping the conversation going. And that's with anything else. you got to put the right people in place. Absolutely. I mean, they say they have psychologists in a lot of these job interviews, but I can't tell. So keeping the conversation going to me, I think, is, is going to be a, 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 a cure. Yeah, it, it's key. It's key because it is the repetition of something that helps to bring about change. Uh, you, you know, people are so quick to say, I had a conversation, and then the counselor had a conversation, and the minister had a Those are conversations. What, what tools are we giving people that they can use every day? I have a practice. I get up, I look in the mirror, and I say, when I go places, when I'm doing engagements, and especially when I'm doing it with high school students, are, are even Archie's. We were, we were at Archie's. Mm -hmm. that, that was middle school and high schoolers. And I say, get up in the morning, and every day you get up, look in the mirror and say, I love you. Fall in love with yourself first so that we can begin to understand what love really feels like because that is not what we get to see every day in the world. What does loving myself feel like? Okay? And then tell yourself, and I am of great value to this planet. Simple things like that. If we were doing something like that, if everybody was doing that every day, I bet you we would go outside. Why is it so much easier for us to make each other feel bad as opposed to, I don't care, I don't care what a person got, and I live in New York, I don't care what a person's got on, and sometimes I've seen some of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen in my life, and I'm just like, my jaw drops, but I can always find something in that person that is beautiful, and I will just say, oh my God. God, that is a beautiful color you have on your fingernails. <laughs> Everything else could just be off and just like, ah, I want to run and scream. But, and when you do that, there's just something that comes over them. They light up like a Christmas tree and smile. Why is it so hard for us to, to, to play, put that forward as opposed to making people feel bad? 